So today, I'd like to look at a very simple version, the Lancaster model of armed conflict. I um I wrote the the disease dynamics lecture before COVID. I wrote this lecture before the Ukrainian invasion. I hope it doesn't seem in bad taste. We'll try to keep this relatively abstract. So Let's look, I mean, let's do this literally as a, a game, a war game. So we've got red army and blue army, and they are competing against each other. And um, will that A and B just literally be the size of the army? As I say, this is a pretty, uh, pretty simplistic. I mean, Lancaster did a lot of stuff. We're looking at a relatively uh, simple version of his model. And that's, I mean, just to show that it's simple. I mean, if we look at how red army changes with time, there are three sort of elements we could include here. And by the time we uh, start analyzing this model, we'll only look at one of those three. But how is red army changing with time? Well, if it's receiving reinforcements, there is a positive reinforcement rate. There is a negative combat loss rate. I mean, soldiers being removed due to, well, due to violence in the combat. And then there's also operational loss. So operational loss would be people being transferred out of one front to go fight on another. It would be people deserting. It would be, if you looked at World War I, there was a horrible outbreak of yellow fever, I think it was. People who uh, died from that would be operational loss. So it's loss due to reasons other than enemy uh, fire or enemy intervention. And as I say, we're going to very much simplify this so that we can look at it in the classroom without, um, without using computer simulations. And we'll just look at combat loss. And I mean, there are I'm calling this a simplification. It is a simplification, but there are certainly in military history have been many conflicts where there was no meaningful reinforcements and no meaningful operational loss. I mean, a lot of the kind of relatively briefer battles of the American Civil War, um, the Battle of Iwo Jima, no, uh, no real operational loss, no desertions or starvation or anything like that. But again, because 
So we are taking this model and making it simpler. It does mean that there are going to be sharp limits to how accuracy the, accurate this model is. I mean, you could, if you look at, say, World War I, the Battle of Verdun, just this protracted, years-long siege to try to claim this this tactically worthless piece of land that everyone had their egos wrapped up in. Uh, the Nazi invasion of Russia, Operation Barbosa, that saw a huge operational loss on both sides due to winter weathers and desertion. It would be totally inappropriate for that. So we're going to only look at losses due to enemy fire or enemy action. And our assumption is going to be simplistic, but natural. We're going to assume that the more people there are in blue army firing on red army, the more people are being removed from red army. This B, this lower case B, um, is a measure of how efficient Blue Army is at using their resources. So you can think of lowercase b as being how well Red Army is trained or how well Red Army is how well Blue Army, I'm sorry, is trained, or how well Blue Army is armed, or any kind of combination of those factors. And we'll treat, for now at least, we'll, uh, we'll treat these armies as being parallel to each other. So as for what happens to Blue Army, well, they take losses that depend on how many soldiers there are in Red Army, and that also depend on how well those soldiers are being utilized that lowercase r constant. So mathematically, uh, this model has one fixed point. I mean, in practice, you have to mix some common sense in, but I mean, mathematically speaking, the only fixed point of this model is mutual destruction. And again, of course, you can use your common sense and say, well, if one army wipes out the other army, now they're not taking losses, so the battle's over, and that's a fixed point. But it's not a fixed point that's mathematically reflected in the model. And this fixed point, uh, maybe we should, maybe next time I should move these sections around to put this right after the predator prey stuff, because this is a fixed point where we can use the Jacobian, unlike the last uh, few examples. The Jacobian at this fixed point. is this, and the eigenvalues are plus or minus the square root of Rb. So um, this fixed point is a saddle, it's unstable, and we do not expect in general, to actually see mutual annihilation, which 
we don't. I mean, if you look at uh, look at military history, it's very rare for two armies to just kind of grind each other into nothing. Um, finding the eigenvalues of this would require some linear algebra background. I mean, we can't use our calculator because our calculator won't know what to do with the letters R and B. So I'll just tell you the positive square root has this. as an eigenvector and the negative square root as this. As an eigenvector. They're the same, except that V1 has a negative sign up there in the first component, and V2 doesn't. And this basically tells the story. I mean, you can you can probably guess what this model is predicting if we're not looking at any kind of reinforcements then the battle will and we are looking at these you know people are constantly being eliminated via these differential equations then eventually one of the armies will wipe out the other army that's our prediction um, and that is exactly what, what these eigenvalues and eigenvectors are telling us. So here is the Cartesian plane. And here is Red Army. And it doesn't really matter because the armies are parallel, which uh, axis you call red and which you call um, blue. I'm going with what I have in my notes. And we have these eigenvectors. And one of the eigenvectors, V1, is... One of these eigenvectors is going uh, up this way. This isn't what I have in my notes, but here, I mean, this is a point in the first quadrant. Let me not write in that arrow. And one of the eigenvectors is going up this way. That's a point in the second quadrant, that negative square root and that one. So these are the eigenvectors, and along this eigenvector, trajectories go into the and, and I said this wasn't in my notes, but this is exactly correct. This is V2. The eigenvalue is negative, so trajectories are going in on this eigenvector. This is V1. Trajectories are, I mean, the eigenvalue is positive, so trajectories go out on this eigenvector. And what do trajectories look like? Well, this is, um, well, they look like this. Or they look like this. Or they look like this. Or they look like this. 
but here's where we have to apply some common sense. Of course, Red Army can't have a negative number of soldiers, neither can Blue Army, meaning that the entire second, third, and fourth quadrant are meaningless. So we don't want to look at that trajectory, and we don't want to look at that trajectory. We do want to look at trajectories that start in the first quadrant, but again, here's where our common sense is going to come in. We have an initial condition. Our trajectory goes like this. Now Blue Army's been wiped out. It doesn't make any sense to keep going and have Blue Army go into a negative number of troops. So even though this isn't a fixed point mathematically, the reality of the situation says that once we reach this value, we stop. And similarly, up here, according to the math of the situation, a trajectory will look something like that. According to the reality of the situation, Red Army will never be negative once the trajectory hits that axis. That um, axis, Red Army has been wiped out and the battle is over. So we predict that either Red Army or Blue Army will be wiped out by all of this. Um, and it, I mean, from the picture I drew, it just depends on which side of that V2 eigenvector we start on. So let's try to analyze this further. I mean, we've reached the common sense conclusion that if battles I mean, obviously, other things that this model does not include is the possibility of surrender. I mean, I don't think most battles literally end with, with a, an army being wiped out. It doesn't include surrender. It doesn't include retreat, because retreat would be an operational loss. Um, but then, according to the model, because it doesn't include these possibilities, battle will end until one of the armies is eliminated. And we can then ask, well, can we make predictions about this? Can we predict which army will be eliminated based on the sizes and the combat abilities of red and blue army? Yeah. And that's our next goal. And the trick we're going to use here is going to be the same trick we used when we were looking at the SIR model. And let's pause a moment and ask ourselves, we use that trick in the SIR model. We are using this trick here. Um, what makes this, what do these models have in common that makes this a useful trick? Because remember that the side effect or the consequence of using parametric derivatives is that we lose all mention of time. Um, we do not have the time variable once we've taken db dr. And that happened with the SIR disease model too. And the reason that that was kind of okay, the reason we could analyze the SIR disease model 
is that one of the variables, the S variable, was always going down. So we don't have any reference to time, but we do know what's happening as time passes. We start here, and then S can only go down. So we're always going in this direction. There's no possibility that we'll start going around and tracing the curve the other way. We can't go back and forth or anything like that. S just always goes down. So we're always moving from right to left. So even though we've eliminated the time parameter, we still know what's happening as time passes. And similarly here, according to this model, because we're neglecting reinforcements, red and blue army can only shrink in size. So if we start here, we have to be going along the curve in this direction. If we were going along the other cur the curve in the other direction, red and blue army would both be increasing in size. So again, even though we're going to eliminate the time parameter, we know what happens as time passes. That's the common thread that these models have that makes this kind of analysis useful. And I won't well on this. I mean, I'll give the details as they're necessary, but this is actually, I mean, aside from the reference to the saddle, this is stuff we could have done way back at the beginning of the course. Um, if we multiply both sides by, what, what did I write? No, I wrote the right thing. I, I saw that B, B. Yeah, and I thought, wait, dB, do I have dB twice? But no, this is as it should be. And if we uh, clear the denominators, this is a separable. Differential equation. We can integrate both sides. So the lowercase letters are constants, the uppercase letters are variables. It's, um, we do not in differential equations routinely use function notation. So even though B and R, capital B and capital R are functions, we don't write them down like that. I know that can sometimes be a little confusing. We can clear those two. We can multiply both sides of this equality by two. And we remember that K is a totally on arbitrary constant of integration. So twice a totally arbitrary constant is still a totally arbitrary constant. Finally, it's going to be convenient to rewrite this. so that that K is alone on one side of the equality. And that's because, I mean, this is something we've done several times now. We did it with air resistance. We did it when we were looking at the SIR model where, okay, we've 
sort of solved the differential equation, but our answer is in terms of this constant of integration k. And that doesn't mean anything. Can we rewrite this? so that instead of some meaningless constant of integration, we have meaningful constants. And we're going to get that from this rewritten equation. We're going to say, okay, well, this is true for every moment of the battle, at least in our mathematical model. So it's true at the start. It's true when T equals zero. And lowercase b and lowercase r are constant. So it does, from their point of view, T being zero doesn't do anything, but capital B and capital R are variables. So letting T be zero is turning this and this into a constant. And our notation, we're not going to use function notation even here, instead of writing B of zero, we're going to write to B sub zero. So B times B sub zero squared, it sounds so bad when I say it out loud, because of course we've got lowercase and uppercase letters. There's K and K is now defined in terms of the initial sizes of these armies and it's defined in terms of the military potency of each of these armies, whatever that means, training or weapon quality, however it might be interpreted. And if we now take this and we plug it in there, We get lowercase b times capital B squared minus lowercase r times r squared um, equals lowercase b, b is zero squared minus lowercase r, r zero squared. And at this point, things are going to get not difficult, but they're going to get, I think, pretty ugly. Um, it's going to be this right-hand side. That's going to control victory. And in particular, it's going to be the sign of that right-hand side that controls victory, whether it's positive or negative. And let's just look at one of these cases in detail. Let's look at the possibility that this is positive, that it's greater than zero. Now we're going to do algebra. I mean, putatively, this is stuff that our 142 students could do, although in practice, they 
might find it uh, difficult. We're going to take both sides of this equality and we're going to divide by the right-hand side. So the left-hand side divided by the right-hand side equals one. And now we can split that left-hand side up into two fractions. When we have subtraction in the numerator, that's the same as having subtraction like this. The denominator does not get split up. Again, this is a putatively college algebra, although a lot of 142 students would not like the subscripts. Honestly, I don't love the subscripts. Um, and now we're going to take each of these fractions and we are going to modify it. We're going to take this first fraction and we're going to multiply it by one. So we're not changing the fraction, but we're writing one in this particular way. We are, I mean, the short way of saying it is that we're dividing top and bottom by B. So, Let's make this line a little bigger. So in the bottom, we're going to have B. When we divide the top by B, it gets rid of it. And then over here, we're going to do the same thing with R. Divide the top by R. Divide the bottom by R. And the reason we're doing this is, I can do it on this frame. I mean, we're trying to, we're trying to make this look like something. And I mean, I don't know if, have all three of you or have any of you seen the conic sections like hyperbolas and stuff? I'm seeing a lot of very, uh, very baffled looking expressions. Um, I don't know, I guess maybe, maybe conic sections would usually be in like, Recalculus, but um, I okay, so we won't uh, worry too much about the details. And in particular, let's just do our last step here. We uh, are going to rewrite this denominator as a square. So we're going to take the square root of the denominator and then we're going to square it. And the square root and the square cancel out. So we're certainly changing how the denominator looks, but we're not changing the details of the denominator. And here's where we're using this fact. 
that inequality means that those denominators were positive, which we need if we're going to take the square root. So what's all this in favor, in, in the word? What's the purpose of all of this? Let me remind myself what our, let's see, we're treating B with dy dx. We're treating at the B army as Y, and we're treating the red army as X. And what we got is B squared over something squared minus R squared over something squared equals one. So this is an example of something called a, let's see, I also, I want Desmos right now. This is an example of a hyperbola. Come on, here we are. If we have x squared over something squared minus y squared over something squared equals one, we get graphs that look like this. And if we reverse x and y, say y squared over three squared minus x squared over five squared equals one, we get graphs that look like this. So let's look at this graph. Um, let's see, our x-axis is Red, our y axis is blue. Um, only the first quadrant makes sense here. We, so this is what the trajectory looks like. We start wherever we start. As time passes, both sides take losses. Eventually we reach this um, axis, we reach this point. One of the armies has been eliminated, the other army is victorious. And I keep forgetting which is which. The Y axis army has been eliminated here. The, uh, the blue army has been eliminated. Now, if you look at this, where the Y comes first, we start wherever we start, time passes, we go this way as time passes because both armies are shrinking. Eventually we reach we reach this value here, and the other army has been eliminated. And this time the y-axis army still has people left. It has three thousand. Let's let's measure this in thousands. Or it would be very pessimistic otherwise. Let's say they have 3,000 people left at the end of the engagement. So we're getting hyperbola 
follows. And the order of the subtraction is telling us which army is victorious and which army is being wiped out. Uh, in this particular case, we're getting trajectories like that. Red Army is eliminated and Never mind the details if you haven't seen hyperbola before, but we can predict the size of blue army after the battle. It's this thing that appears um, in the denominator. It's the square root. So does it intuitively make sense? I've talked before about, um, you know, well, I haven't really talked about them at length, but I've said that if you look at real world models, they some, sometimes they have so many parameters that it's really kind of easy to lose the thought. And you have like, if this equation with 20 parameters in it is satisfied, then this will happen. But if this other equation with 30 parameters in it is satisfied, then this different thing will happen. And it's really hard to sort of get any intuition. Um, here, that is, I think, not the case. It makes sense that Red Army is eliminated because this inequality that I've circled here can be rewritten like that. And B, lowercase b, is a measurement of how strong blue army is. And capital B sub zero is also a measurement of how strong blue army is. So if their, their product is likewise a measurement of how strong blue army is. It's their, I mean, it's their initial size squared times their combat ability. Likewise, lowercase r times capital R sub zero squared is a measurement of how strong red army is. It's the product of their size squared times their combat abilities. So if this is a measurement of how strong blue army is, and this is a measurement of how strong red army is, then it makes perfect sense to say that if blue army is stronger than red army, blue army will win the engagement. This square gives us something that even, and, and I'm not going to go through the details, but if this inequality is reversed, then the outcome is reversed. This uh, gives us the Lancaster square law. 
which says that the strength of a military depends on the square of its size. So say that Red Army is you know, looking for at an engagement in the future. And it can predict that it's going to lose this engagement. And it sees two ways to stop that from happening. It can try to increase the lower case R, invest in better training, invest in better weapons, or it can try to increase capital R sub zero, try to get more people in the arm. Yeah. Well, the Lancaster Square Law says that if you can increase the army, that's going to be better because any increase to the size of the army is then going to be in improved upon, it's going to be magnified by this square. Whereas any increase to lowercase r is just an increase to lowercase r. It's not going to be magnified by anything. Um, I should say, I mean, this is sort of, delicate ground, or not delicate so much as unpleasant ground. This really only works if the, there is some kind of parity between militaries. I mean, we have seen this country specifically with the conquest of the native population has seen, I'm um, sort of very small armies with very powerful weaponry just completely decimate large groups of people. So there has to be some kind of parity between the armies or this will all kind of break down. But Assuming the two armies, I mean, we've got two industrial nations at each other's throat, we do have the Lancaster Square Law. Are there questions about this? Then we have a little time. I'm, I'll keep going, but I'll go kind of briefly through the next topic. Again, because, well, because a lot of the math is really kind of uninteresting. We're doing sort of ugly looking algebra more than anything else. What if one of the armies doesn't see any paths? Because satisfying this inequality, it doesn't see any path to, to um, really increasing its size. It doesn't see any path to really increasing its weapons. Well, then they could attempt guerrilla tactics. And guerrilla warfare, I mean, we still have 
reinforcements and we still have operational loss, which I'm still going to neglect. Um, so we're just going to change the equations for combat loss a little here. So we'll use G and C for guerrilla army and conventional army. And let me write down the conventional army equation first, because it's the same. It's just the size of the guerrilla army times a constant reflecting how efficient the guerrilla army is. So, for the conventional army, we still have this term, but we're going to have an additional, I mean, for the guerrilla army. Their size, the bigger the conventional army is, the smaller the guerrilla army will shrink. The better trained or better armed the conventional army is, the faster the guerrilla army will shrink. But also, the bigger the guerrilla army is, the faster the guerrilla army will shrink. And let's try to interpret that. We'll give a, a very literal interpretation. Let's say out here, we have the conventional army and the guerrilla army is in the woods. And they are hidden and the conventional army cannot see them. But the conventional army can certainly fire mortars or other armaments into the woods. So even though they can't see the guerrilla army, they can still eliminate members of the guerrilla army. But because they can't see the members of the guerrilla army, they're relying basically on luck to eliminate it. They're firing where they hope the guerrilla army is, and they either get lucky or they don't. Well, if the guerrilla army is large, it's going to be relatively easy for them to get hit. So if the guerrilla army is large, a lot of them are going to get hit and the size of the guerrilla army will shrink quickly. If the guerrilla army is relatively small, then suddenly, I mean, we had these things, suddenly gunshots that would have shrunk the size of the guerrilla army are missing and are not shrinking the size of the guerrilla army. So a guerrilla army sort of relies on being fairly small so that it is harder for it to lose members. Let's see. This thing now has a, uh, a whole line of fixed points. Um, any value where the guerrilla army has been eliminated is a fixed point of this model, which makes sense. Um, this model still, I mean, still requires common sense. Because according to this model, if the conventional army is zero, if the conventional army has been eliminated, that's not a fixed point. 
and the army that's been eliminated and has zero members will continue to shrink according to that form to look. So again, you need to apply your common sense here. But since we have this entire line of fixed points, probably the Jacobian is out. Um, in fact, definitely the Jacobian is out. So let's look. Assume at DC DG. I normally don't use function notation. I mean, textbooks normally don't either. But having that lowercase c and having that uppercase c is really confusing. At least I think it is. Let's use function notation so that there's no risk of getting them confused. So when we take this parametric derivative, this is what we get. Once again, we can separate variables. Uh, Once again, we integrate. Error spotted this negative sign and that negative sign are canceling. So there's no negative sign in front of that lowercase g. Hold on, I made a mistake. I made a more serious mistake. I'm treating this lowercase g as if it's a variable and it's not. Lowercase g is a constant. It doesn't get this square and this two. What happens when you integrate a constant is you get a con is that you get the constant times the variable. And this time, um, we're once again going to clear that two. Going back a ways, going back quite a ways. When we cleared the two here, it just vanished. There was a one half on the left and a one half on the right, and two times k is still k, so it just disappeared. Of course, that doesn't happen here because there's no one half on the left. So when we get rid of the two from, I mean, there's no one half on the right. So when we get rid of the two on the left, we end up with a two on the right. And because we've already done this, let me just, we let time be a zero. Let 
letting time be zero, lets us write K in terms of meaningful things, the size of the guerrilla army and the size of the conventional army at the start of the conflict, together with the strength of the guerrilla army and the strength of the conventional army. We'll take that value of K and plug it in there. I'll just crank you, plug it in there. We get whatever we get. I, nothing very exciting, I'm afraid. And we can solve for G of T. And at this point, I'm just, it's tedious, but you're all math majors. You can all solve for a variable. And now this looks really complicated, and it isn't particularly. It's much easier, it's much simpler than it looks in all of this mess. Our variables appear twice. We've got the C variable on the left, and we've got the G variable on the right, and all of that other stuff is just a constant. And let's go to Desmos, and let's, let me see, let me remind myself, so we're treating the conventional army as Y. So when I go to Desmos, this will be a Y. And we're treating the guerrilla army as X. So when I go to Desmos, that will be an X. And I mean, if at the start of all of this, i done this differently, I could probably have taken D, G, D, C, and it wouldn't have mattered. But once I took this derivative, I'm kind of committed. It's the, the derivative of the um, dependent variable over the derivative of the independent variable, which is why I say that this is X and this is Y. So let's look at something like three y squared equals x. And y is the size of an army, it's positive. So this is a parabola. And this parabola predicts mutual annihilation. Both the armies go down until they're both driven to destruction. But that's, uh, I mean, that's an aberrant case. That would only happen if this thing we're subtracting is exact zero, which we would not expect in any real world situation. The key here is that I say this thing we're subtracting, but we're either subtracting 
adding or adding something here based on whether this is positive or negative. If this is positive, we're subtracting. If this is negative, the negative signs cancel and we're adding. Go back to Desmos. If we put subtraction here, well, we see what happens. We start wherever we start. And as time passes, both armies shrink until eventually we reach this point where army X has been driven uh, to destruction, where the guerrilla army has been wiped out. So this subtraction causes the guerrilla army to be wiped out, but if we had addition, we'd get a graph that looks like this, and now it's the conventional army that gets wiped out. So it's the sign of this, whether this is positive or negative, that controls whether we have addition or subtraction. And it's therefore the size of this that decides, that determines who wins the day? If if this inequality is satisfied, um. Notice that guerrilla armies do not benefit from the Lancaster Square law. It's kind of the opposite. If the guerrilla army is too big, it's going to get wiped out really quickly. If this inequality is satisfied, the conventional army wins. If the reverse inequality is satisfied, then the what a devil spell gorilla and never remember. Then the gorilla. Army wins. And I wanted to show you some pictures real quick. Just from my slides. So suppose that. Here we have two armies. Maybe their sizes are measured in thousands. This is the line where the two armies um, are the same size. Suppose that one army is worse trained or worse armed or in whatever way worse than the other army. Well, they can still win by outnumbering them sufficiently. Here's, I mean, here's this inequality plotted out with X's and Y's instead of red and blue. And we see there's this region where the worse equipped army still wins just because they outnumber the other army. Now suppose that, that the opposite is true, that this army that is worse equipped is also outnumbered. Well, then according to this, they're going to lose. 
So according to this, the red and blue army stuff, um, the only way to win is to be down here in this shaded category, which only happens if, um, if they outnumber the, the better equipped army. We now look at guerrilla warfare. There's this sliver here. It's, if, it's in purple, if that's helpful to you. Um, it's the little shaded region above the line Y equals X. And this region satisfies the inequality that gives the guerrilla army victory. So the guerrilla army is both worse equipped and it is outnumbered, but it's still able to win. Um, I've mentioned this several times that guerrilla warfare requires the guerrilla army to be small. Here is a region where a guerrilla army outnumbers the conventional army. And if they just use conventional warfare, they would win. But because they're using guerrilla tactics instead, we predict them to lose. So do you see that here? I mean, this area where the guerrilla army can win requires the guerrilla army to be relatively small. And I mean, in practice, it also requires the conventional army to be relatively small. You see, when we get out here, where both the conventional army and where the conventional army is really big, guerrilla tactics aren't some magical thing that can fix being outnumbered 10,000 to one or something. It requires, once again, that there be some parity between the militaries. And that, I believe, is that we should have, let's see, syllabus probably just says two tests, is that right? There's no reason you'd remember that. It probably says two tests, so maybe we'll just have our final exam, um, and the next two weeks there are some interesting things we can talk about, not models, but think we can talk about chaos, which is a very good thing to discuss.